But uh, we're going to begin by singing, and uh, you'll find the words of the hymn in these blue hymn books, and at number 196, Joachim Neander's great hymn, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of Creation. Number 196. As we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. All that has life and breath, come now with praises before him. The psalmist says, The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He has made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high 
as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Gracious God, our Father, how we praise you that we come to one who loves us tenderly and wonderfully and everlastingly, more than any earthly father can ever love us, more nearly, more intimately, more strongly, more fearsomely. We praise you that for everyone who names your name, who loves your Son, we have this marvelous assurance that the God who made us from dust, who remembers us in all our weaknesses, in all our fearfulness, that he is a God who has promised good to us, one who has covenanted to be near us, not only now in this earthly life, not only on the path of life where you have promised always to be our shepherd, but forever and ever and ever. That you will never leave us nor forsake us. And there is nothing we can do, nothing any other can do that can separate us from your love, which is ours in Christ Jesus, your Son. What a comfort, O oh God, it is to feeble, frail human flesh that when we are forced to look with honesty at our own frame and see all our weaknesses, all our shame, all our fearful failure, we have a God who knows all these things and yet loves us, accepts us, promises that you will be ours forever despite all that we are and all that we are not. So, Father, that's why we come tonight together in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, to name him as our Lord and Savior, to bow before you as our great sovereign. We come because we know that you, a God of great power and might, and nevertheless a God of great mercy and grace and abounding steadfast love. So, Lord, we come to you knowing our needs, but knowing also your promise to meet all of these needs and abundantly more. Some of us come tonight with fear in our hearts, O oh God, fearing what this coming week will bring. Perhaps major surgery in hospital. Perhaps struggles and anticipated troubles and trials at work. Maybe agonizing news from someone in the family of illness or loss or bereavement. Some of us, Lord, perhaps coming and feeling, although the sun bathes the surroundings of our city today in light, nevertheless, a cloud of darkness hangs over our life because of something that's happened or something that we expect to happen. Some of us, perhaps, sorrowing because of the struggle which seems so endless with our sin. We've disappointed ourselves and others once again this week. And we wonder if ever, ever we shall conquer these things which grieve us and we know grieve you. How we thank you that however we come into your presence tonight, we come to a God of steadfast love. How we praise you for the knowledge that the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on all those who fear him, on all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we come 
needy people as we are, knowing that we need you, but knowing that all our needs will ever be met in you now, from this day forth and always. So come to us, Lord, we pray. We come to your word, which we know is your living word, a word written in these scriptures, which is life itself to us, because it tells us of your goodness and your grace, your love and your mercy, and warns us also to fear you and to obey. Help us, Lord, we pray, to receive that word tonight, to take it to heart, that where we need to be disturbed and our comfort rattled, that you would do that where we need to know more of your mercy and encouraging grace, you also would reveal that to us. So, Lord, come to us, we pray, as we come to you in expectant faith and draw near to us to bless. For we ask all these things in confidence and with joy because we do so in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, Paul is going to come shortly and uh, read the Scriptures to us. We're going to be studying in the letter of Jude again. But just before we do that, let's sing once again the hymn on the screens, which uh, helps us to continue in prayer. Our Father God, who dwells in heaven, draw near to hear your children. Well, a very good evening to you all. Please do 
Grab your Bibles and turn with me to Jude, the letter of Jude, which comes tucked away just before Revelation at the end of our Bible. So please turn to Jude, which is page 1027 in the Church Bibles, 1027. Now, this is the final installment in our time in Jude. We've had uh, two Sundays already. This is our final Sunday, and we're going to be thinking particularly about the last five verses of the letter. But to refresh us, I'll read from verse 1 for those that have missed perhaps the first two weeks. So I'll start at verse 1 of the letter of Jude. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith, that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now, I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are blemishes on your love feasts, as they feast with you without fear, looking after themselves. Waterless clouds swept along by the wind, fruitless trees in late autumn twice dead uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, The Lord came with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud-mouthed boasters showing favoritism to gain advantage. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, build yourselves up in the most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, 
waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Now, as we've been thinking about in the past weeks, the task of contending for the gospel may seem daunting, but Jude, in these last verses, brings us great assurance that we have a God who is able, and we're going to sing of that now as we turn in our hymn books to hymn number 774, A Sovereign Protector Have I. So let's stand and sing together, number 774. just a moment, the offering will be uplifted as our musicians play, but you might want to reflect, take a moment to read uh, these verses in Jude that we'll be thinking about later. The offering will now be uplifted.
Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the great privilege it is to meet together tonight as part of your family. We thank you for the opportunity to meet with each other, to sing praise to you, to read your word. And we do thank you for all the good gifts that you give us day by day. And we thank you that we are able to give something of that back to you. So, Father, I do pray that you would use these gifts in a way that is for the furtherance of your gospel here in this city and further afield as we support missionaries in many lands. Father, I do pray that this money that we have given, and not only that, but our time and talents might be used for your glory. And Father, as we think during the uh, summer holidays at the moment and the various camps that are happening at the moment, we think particularly of the Scripture Union camps that have been happening and are happening right now and will be happening in the future weeks. We do pray for those young people that are going along that they might hear something of the truth of the gospel, that they might enjoy themselves as they uh, meet friends and enjoy various activities. Father, I do pray particularly that you would uh, be bringing young people into your kingdom uh, through these camps over the summer. And we think too of uh, churches across this land today that are meeting churches that hold to the gospel, that proclaim the gospel without fear. And we do ask you might encourage them as they go about the task of bringing your word to folk. And we think too of uh, Cornhill, which starts a new term in September, and we do pray particularly for the Cornhill tutors who are taking a rest over the summer months. Do you pray they might be refreshed and eager to start again in the autumn? And we do pray for the new uh, recruits who are going to be starting the course in September. Do you pray you might equip those who are going to be joining uh, the Cornhill course? Uh, and we think too of uh, UCCF, which does much good work in our universities, and pray particularly as they plan ahead for the next term and get ready for Freshers' Week uh, in just a couple of months. So, Father, we do pray for all these individuals and organizations across this land that are seeking to bring uh, the gospel to those who do not know you. Do pray for boldness, pray they might be encouraged and might enjoy good rest over these summer months. We do pray these things for the furtherance of your kingdom and for your name. Amen. Well, before we come to think about these verses in Jude, we are going to sing together from our hymn books, number 548, How Sure the Scriptures Are, number 548, as we come to God's Word.
Well, do please have uh, the letter of Jude open in front of you as we spend these moments looking at verses 20 to 25. Let me take you back to the 1950s for a moment and to the United States of America. In the post-war era, not all was calm as the Cold War began to bubble away. There was real and genuine concern about the influence of communism in some quarters. And at the head of that anti-communist charge was Senator Joseph McCarthy, Now, during the McCarthy era, thousands of Americans were accused of being communists or communist sympathizers, and they became the subject of investigations and questioning by the government. If you liked the color red, or even thought about liking the color red, you'd be dragged up in front of the House Un-American Activities Committee, headed by Senator McCarthy, and you would face serious questioning for a number of hours. Now I mention this not to make some sort of political point, but to mention the phrase McCarthyism, which has now come to mean the practice of making accusations of disloyalty, subversion, or treason without proper regard for the evidence. That's McCarthyism, bringing charges without proper evidence. But why mention this? Why bring up McCarthyism? Well, given the first two-thirds of Jude's letter, we might, without reading these final verses, come to the conclusion that Jude is calling us to some sort of McCarthyist response as he makes his plea for us to contend for the faith. But as as we will see, that is not the way we are to go about contending for the faith. So then, how are we to go about contending for the faith? That has been the question in the back of our minds over these last couple of weeks. After the first Sunday together, we were eager to get to the how question. Jude sets out his central plea there in verse 3, which is to contend for the faith. And his reason for doing so is there in verse 4. Unnoticed people have crept into the church and presents a very real and dangerous threat to the gospel. Why do they present a threat? Well, because they are striking at the very heart of what it means to be a Christian. They pervert the grace of God, turning it into a license for immorality, and they deny the Lord Jesus Christ. So we saw the need to contend. But how? That's the natural question, isn't it? We can see that the stakes are very high. The very future of the church Jude was writing to is hanging in the balance. But Jude didn't deal with the how question straight away. He spends the large central trunk of the letter going into real detail about the certain judgment and condemnation that these people, these unnoticed people face. And he also goes into detail about what they are like. And so last Sunday, we saw that Jude was urging us to do two things. Remember that Jesus is judge, but also learn to recognize the danger signs. That's what we saw last week. And it was heavy going stuff, wasn't it? And as we come to these final verses in Jude's short letter, We are reaching not some sort of footnote to the letter. It's not an aside. It's really the climax to all that Jude has been saying. Here, Jude gets to the very heart of how we are to go about contending for the faith. If Jude had just stopped at verse 19, his readers and we would be at a bit of a loss, wouldn't we? He's issued his urgent appeal He's spoken at length about what these people are like and how we're to spot them. We've seen where they're ultimately headed. If he had just left it there, we would be all over the shop in terms of how to respond to that, how to contend. So for those who are naturally 
contentious and up for a good argument, they would approach the situation all guns blazing. Anyone who even comes close to what Jude is talking about would be getting kicked out. They would conduct some sort of McCarthyist witch hunt, interrogating people who don't quite toe the line on a minor point of theology. But that is not what Jude is calling for. Other people who naturally do anything to avoid any sort of argument or dispute, they would put their heads firmly into the sands and hope that everything would just pan out in the end. But that is not what Jude is calling for either. He points us not to passivity, nor to mass excommunications of certain people. No, Jude's approach is far more nuanced and gracious than all that. And tonight, Jude points us in three directions. He points us in, he points us out, and he points us up. In, out, and up. So firstly, Jude urges us in verses 20 and 21 to look in. Look in and build yourselves up. Verses 20 to 21. Jude doesn't start where we perhaps expect him to start. We'd probably expect Jude to head straight into those people that are being sucked in by these false teachers. But he doesn't begin there, does he? He begins by urging his readers to build themselves up in verse 21. Verse 20, but you, beloved, build yourselves up in your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. There are four things that Jude instructs his dear, beloved Christians to do. Building, praying, keep, and waiting. Sounds a little bit like we have to do something here. And that's absolutely right. Christianity is not for spectators. It's a faith which encourages us to be up and doing. Not that we earn anything by doing that, but our doing is in response to what Christ has already done for us and calls us to do. So then let's look at these four things. Firstly, building yourselves up. Jude urges us to build ourselves up. The image here is of the church in terms of the people, the church as a building. And it's a building that is not going to be built up by doing nothing. Growing as Christians and growing more closely together as Christians are duties which the New Testament writers frequently compare to a building site. Quite often they talk about this in terms of a building site. Effort is required. Build yourselves up, says Jude. But in what are we to build ourselves up in? Does Jude just leave it vacuous? No, he tells us. We are to build ourselves up in the most holy faith. It's the faith that Jude has already mentioned right the way back there in verse 3. It's the faith that's to be contended for. The once for all delivered to the saints' faith. Build yourselves up in that faith, says Jude. It's not vague. It's not subjective. It's the one true faith that we're to build ourselves up in. It's the faith that is fully revealed in the Bible, God's living word to us. So build yourselves up in that. And as my old minister from home says, we do that by studying the Bible, believing the Bible, and obeying the Bible. Studying, believing, obeying. And this is to be done individually, yes, but really Jude is addressing us as a congregation, as a community of believers, Building up takes place in the context of the local church. It takes place as we sit under God's word week by week on Sundays. As we rub together, rub shoulders together after, after the services, talking and getting to know each other, encouraging one another. And as we meet during the week in small groups or at the prayer meeting, we need to be all spiritually plugged in to the life of the church to ensure that we are growing up in the faith, being built up and building others up too. So the question is, are you being built up as part of the church community? 
It's vital if we are to contend for the gospel, says Jude. Build yourselves up, which is in stark contrast to what the false teachers are doing. If you look back in verse 19, it is these who cause divisions. These people break down, they cause divisions. Jude calls us to the opposite. Build yourselves up. So the plea to you is, beloved Christians, build yourselves up. That's the first thing. Next, Jude tells us to be praying in the Holy Spirit. Jude urges us to pray. It sounds so simple, and it is simple. He simply tells us to pray. That is how we speak to our Heavenly Father. We do it by praying. It's a huge privilege, and yet we so often take advantage of it. We spend so little time praying to our Heavenly Father who is able. How are we to pray? Well, Jude tells us we're to do it in the Holy Spirit, which perhaps sounds a little mystical, but it isn't at all. Praying in the Holy Spirit is the only way a Christian can ever pray. Every time a Christian speaks to their Heavenly Father, they do so in the Holy Spirit. None of us pray without the prompting of the Holy Spirit. So Jude urges us to pray. That is what Jude calls us to do in the face of dangerous people who threaten to undermine the very gospel. Pray to him who is able because he is able and we're to seize each opportunity to do so. The prayer meeting here every other Wednesday provides us with an opportunity to pray together, to build each other up and to pray to our Heavenly Father. What's stopping us from coming along to that? Build yourselves up. Pray. And then Jude tells us to keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourselves. Now this is the second side of the coin that Jude shows us there in verse 1 where he wrote, to those who are called, beloved in God, and kept for Jesus Christ. So there in verse 1, Jude reassures us of what God has done for the Christian. You are loved, you are kept, says Jude. But here we see the other side of the coin, which is our human responsibility. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Yes, God keeps you, but we are also to keep ourselves in his love. We have a responsibility. But how are we to do that? How can we keep ourselves in the love of God? Well, in John chapter 15, Jesus tells us how when he says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. If you keep my commandments... You see, obedience is the key. We are to obey our Heavenly Father. And that's the very opposite to what these false teachers have been doing. They've been turning the grace of God into a license for sensuality, denying the Lordship of Jesus. Don't worry about obedience, they say. That's old-fashioned and restrictive. But Jews said, that is not the way at all. Keep yourselves in the love of God, which is the safest place you can be, and we keep ourselves through obedience. So building, praying, keep yourselves in the love of God. And then lastly, Jude says, be waiting for the mercy of Jesus Christ. Be waiting for the mercy of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like waiting for things very much. Just ask my wife. If we decide to go and do something, I want to be there straight away and do it. We like to have things now, don't we? New clothes, I want it now. The new iPhone, I want it right now. Enjoyment, I want it right now. And that is what these false teachers were doing. They were urging these beloved Christians to live for the here and now, without regard for what is to come. Sensuality now, pleasure now. Now, 
God does give us good and great gifts to enjoy now. Don't misunderstand me. But Jude wants us to remember that biblical faith is a faith that is primarily fixed on the future. Biblical faith is a faith primarily fixed on the future. That is where Jude wants us to fix our gaze as he speaks about the mercy of Jesus. Mercy is something to be experienced in the future, says Jude. As Christians living now, we wait for the mercy of Jesus Christ, which is the salvation he promises for all who trust in him for the forgiveness of sin. It is a salvation that we have on the day he returns, and it leads to, verse 21, eternal life. This is something worth waiting for. But the false teachers in the church who live only for today, despite what they may say, they have zero hope for the future. Wait for the mercy of Jesus Christ. It is worth waiting for. So we have four things as Jude urges us to look in. Build, pray, keep, and wait But why does Jude do this? Why does Jude focus his attention firstly on looking in? Why does he he speak firstly to the Christians, telling them to look in? Well, the foundations of any community of believers has to be solid. The building of the church must be on solid ground. The contending for the faith that Jude is urging us to do must have its roots in the firm concrete of building, praying, keeping, and waiting. Jude knows that without this, the church won't be able to withstand the undermining gospel, the undermining of the gospel threatened by these people, these unnoticed people that he talks about. Look in. Build a firm foundation, says Jude, as we contend for the gospel. So that's the first thing. Jude calls us to look in. And secondly, he encourages us to look out. Show mercy on those who are doubting, verses 22 and 23. Look in and look out. Our attention here is turned to others. And Jude has in mind three types of people. And these aren't hard and fast distinctions, but they are sort of grades of people who have come under the influence of these false teachers, people who are beginning to get sucked in under their dangerous influence. So as we turn to these people who are being sucked in, we might be feeling a bit sort of G'd up by what Judah's being saying. Let's give them what they deserve. They've been sucked in. They need to be given the the old heave-ho, don't they? they? They've gone off track. But that is not Jude's attitude at all. He says, show mercy. Show mercy to these people. Now, I wasn't quite expecting that as I read through Jude for the first time. After all the build-up, urging us to contend, to fight for the gospel, I was almost expecting some sort of Rocky, Rambo, Sylvester Stallone-type intervention. But instead, we are told to show mercy. Jude's approach is gracious. And we're told to show it in different ways depending on how influenced certain people have been by these false teachers. So the very first group he mentions are, verse 22, those who doubt. There in verse 22. These are people who are a bit unsure about what to believe. Perhaps they're intrigued by what these false teachers are saying and doing. They think to themselves, they might be onto something here. They think that what they are peddling looks quite attractive, but they're not fully convinced. Something is gnawing at the back of their minds, warning them against following such people. But they, quite, they can't quite pin down their uncertainty, their doubt. They're doubting about the once for all delivered to the saints' faith. But they're not fully convinced by these false teachers either. They are people who doubt. 
And to such people, Jude says, we are to show mercy. We're not to be hard-handed or to condemn them. Remember that the Christian is a recipient of mercy. And the Christian is to show the very same to those who are wavering in their faith, says Jude. We are to spend time with such people. Field their genuine, real questions. Talk through why the once for all delivered for the saints' faith is the only faith. And why these false teachers are departing from that and into destruction. We are to show mercy for them. If we are so driven to achieve theological purity that folk are unable to raise legitimate questions, then something's quite wrong. We need to show mercy to those who doubt. That's the first group of people that Jude directs our attention to. Then there's a group who followed the false teachers a bit further down the road. There in verse... um, 23, save others by snatching them out of the fire. That's the next group Jude talks about. These people are more than just doubters. They have, they have dipped their toes firmly into the pool of the false teacher's sensuality and sinful behavior. For such folk, Jude tells us to save them by snatching them out of the fire. You see, even for such people, restoration is possible. They've not gone too far. Jude is taking taking this image of snatching from the fire from the prophet of Zechariah, there in chapter 3 of Zechariah, where he has this vision of Joshua being plucked from the fire. And the point Jude is making is this. In the same way that Joshua was plucked from the fire with his filthy garments and was restored, such people in the church who have been sucked in with these false teachers, can also be plucked from the fire and restored. We are urged to save them because they need rescue. They perhaps don't see how far they have strayed from the one true gospel. Their behaviour flies in the face of all that God has commanded his people. And we are to pluck them out of the fire, not to condemn them, So we are to save others by snatching them out of the fire, says Jude. That's the second group that have moved under the influence of these false teachers. And then there's a third group that Jude talks about there in verse 23. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now, Jude's final group are clearly up to their necks with these false teachers. They followed in their doctrine and their way of living. And it would be very tempting to think that these people are really beyond the pale. These people have clearly abandoned the faith. Let them go, we might think. But no, we're still to show mercy. But Jude is very careful to add something. He says, mercy mixed with fear. What is Jude talking about? Fear of what? Well, I think the very next sentence helps us. Hating even the garment stained by the flesh. That is, hating the sinful behavior itself. We're to be very careful when we're dealing with such folk that we are not uh, sucked in as well by their lifestyle and their living. They've been drawn in. So let's not be tempted to think that we're somehow above it all and immune to it. It would be quite easy to be drawn into joining them in their belief and behavior. But we are to try and bring such people back to the one true faith, but hating the stained clothing, that is, their sinful activity. We are to be crystal clear as we get alongside such folk, that the behavior is unacceptable and is, in reality, a rejection of the lordship of Jesus and a denial of the grace of God. So as we look out to those who have been sucked in, we are not to compromise on the truth. Remember Jude's plea to contend for the one true gospel. 
We are not to compromise on that. But that doesn't mean we are not to show mercy and love to those who have come under the influence of these dangerous people. Look out and show mercy, urges Jude. Some people have come under the influence of these false teachers. Show mercy. So we've looked in, we've looked out, and we begin to feel the weight of our responsibilities, don't we? Jude is urging us to do things, to take responsibilities. But now, Jude directs our gaze to God. He calls us to look up to the only God who is able. We look in, we look out, and we look up to the only God who is able. Verses 24 and 25. Jude, in this great climax to the letter, ends with words that are quite familiar to us. You often hear these words being read at the end of a church service. But let's forget our familiarity for a moment and notice what Jude is saying and why he says it here. He points us to our great Father in heaven and says, He is able. He is able to do two great, wonderful, reassuring things for the Christian believer who is faced with contending for the gospel. He is able to keep you from stumbling, and he is able to present you blameless before his glory on that great day of judgment. Two great things. He is able to keep you from stumbling, firstly. He's able to keep you from stumbling. Why does Jude remind them and us of this great truth? Well, there is much that might trip up the Christian in Jude's letter. Certainly there was much to trip up his original recipients, and there was much that might trip us up today as we go about contending for the gospel, as we fight against false teachers who undermine the gospel. There are trip houses at every turn in this letter, aren't there? as we contend for the faith. But we are reassured that as we undertake our responsibilities, we can be sure that God is sovereign. He is able. He is able to keep us from stumbling. And as we look in and build ourselves up, and as we look out and show mercy on those who doubt, we can be sure that he is there and he is able. His keeping us from stumbling goes hand in hand with our undertaking of our responsibilities. They go side by side. God's sovereignty and our responsibility. We are not to see see this reassurance that Jude gives us here at the end as a call to do nothing. We're not to put our feet up and think, God's got it covered. Not at all. He keeps us as we work out our faith. He will not let us go. He is able. He is right there beside us. And we can echo the psalmist's words. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. This is the God who is able to help you, to keep you from stumbling as we contend for the gospel. Be comforted by that. It is a wonderful truth. And Jude reminds us here at the end of this letter. And secondly, he is able to present you blameless. That's the other thing that Jude reminds us of here. He is able to present you blameless. Now, after all his talk in the letter about the condemnation that faces these false teachers. Jude provides great reassurance for his beloved Christian brothers and sisters. And he does it for those original readers and for us now. On that great day of judgment, we will stand before him and we will stand before him blameless, not because of anything we have done or can do, but because we have a savior in Jesus Christ, a saviour who died in our place for our sin. That is how we are able to stand there blameless on that great 
final day. In stark contrast to these certain people that Jude mentions, these gospel underminers, who, as we saw last week, are headed for judgment and condemnation. Jude reassures his dear beloved Christians, he can present you blameless. And these wonderful and great truths that Jude reminds us of free us from anxiety and fear as we contend for the gospel. We don't need to be anxious over our contending because he can keep you from stumbling. We don't need to fear that great day of judgment because he is able to present you blameless. Great reassurance as we look up to the only God who is able So we have Jude's three how-tos of contending for the one true faith. Look in. Build yourselves up. Look out. Show mercy to those who are doubting. And look up to the only God who is able. Jude's plea is an urgent plea. He is calling us to an urgent task because there has been and always will be certain people in the visible church, who present a real and present danger to the church. It's under threat from people who are undermining the very foundations of the faith, the grace of God and the Lordship of Jesus Christ. They are a dangerous threat, says Jude, because they are unnoticed. Jude reminds us of the certain judgment and condemnation that these people face. And he helps us to recognize the danger signs. Are we prepared to contend for the faith? Edward touched on that this morning, didn't he? Are you prepared to contend for the faith? It is the question that Jude is posing to us in this letter. Are we understanding of how we're to go about that task in these final verses? Are we not greatly reassured by God's sovereign keeping of us in that task? What wonderful reassurance we have in our God who is able, and that must lead us to praise. So let me read Jude's closing verses, which give us the vocabulary to praise him who is able. Look down at me at these last verses. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before his presence, before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. We'll be picking up on some of these themes in our final hymn together. So please would you pick up your hymn books and turn to number 579. And in particular, notice the final verse of that hymn, which reassures us that your mercy will not fail us, nor leave your work undone. With your right hand to help us, the victory shall be won. And then by earth and heaven your name shall be adored. And this shall be their anthem, one church, one faith, one Lord. Let's stand and sing to our Heavenly Father.
don't have to rush off, do stay and uh, have tea and coffee downstairs, and uh, let's encourage one another, part of what Paul was speaking about there, building one another up together in love. But as we close, let's just pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for opening your word up to us this evening so clearly. We thank you that it is a word ever needed by your church, ever needed by us. And so we pray you would help us to be true contenders for the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not contentious people, but unafraid to contend. Sometimes it may be costly, but guide us even as you guard us. And as we do so, contending for that truth, help us also to be, as we've heard, people not of malice, but of mercy, seeking to hold out that great gospel of life to those who are perishing, just as we were perishing when you held out your great mercy to us. So, as you, O oh God, are able to keep us forever in your love, help us to keep one another in that love until the great day of mercy, which leads to eternal life. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and till that day. Amen.